Good evening. It's good to see everybody here tonight. Welcome to Wednesday night Landmarks Bible Study. What a great looking p bunch of people we have here this evening. I don't know about you, but I have spent my entire day looking forward to getting in the presence of the Lord with this group of people and just waiting to see what He has to say to us. I love a midweek service. Amen? Amen. If you would, would you stand with me as we get ready to go to the Lord in prayer? And I would remind you, if... Um, if you're interested, we announced um, Sunday that we're gonna. We've got plans to start our um, Celebrate Recovery program in house here, um, and there's registration forms back there by Sister Anita. If you aren't interested, you're unable to do that. We would ask you to please hook up with us and just pray for that ministry. Let's start praying for all the ministries that we have going on here at Landmark Church. Yeah. We've got a lot of things that we're, we've got going on. It's for us. It's great. We, you know, we want to be built up, but we are also wanting to get out. We're wanting to move in the community. We're wanting to pull people in. We're wanting people to experience this love of Jesus Christ that we have freely been given. And let's pray that God begins to use the things that we're doing here for his glory. Amen. We're going to lift up tonight Melissa and Al and Vicki and Justin Haas's father who are all struggling with cancer. And also Sarah, who we reported on Sunday, um, they found another tumor on her um, brain. I talked to um, Barb this evening, Sister Barb, and she's not doing well. And the family needs a spirit of encouragement to fall over them. They're, they're just emotionally in a bad place. So let's, let's just really pray for Sarah and her family this week. We're going to continue to lift up John and Susan Gieselman and um, the physical conditions that they each are going through and just believe God to continue to do what he's been doing and to heal them both and sister Barb obviously not with us again she is not feeling well she says one minute she feels better the next minute she's feeling awful so let's just pray that she gets the rest that she needs in the next few days that her body begins to heal and God would just touch her and encourage her um, we want to lift up um, Patty and Cheryl's mother, Carolyn Mankey. Um, she's not feeling well, and we're just, we've prayed for her before. We're going to pray that God would touch her physically yeah. and just emotionally. Just yeah. God would just move in her life. We want to continue to lift up Carol Strange and just believe for healing in his life. Terry Moore, we know that he needs a powerful move of God in his life, and we're going to believe in Jesus' name that he's going to receive that touch. Bob Rainey, we've been praying for him physically. We've been praying a little bit physically or spiritually also. And I will say that um, I talked to uh, Sister Barb, and through this physical thing that he's going through, he did have a spiritual experience, and he did respond to God. And I just want to give God thanks for that. I want to give this church thanks for being faithful in prayer for Bob. We want to continue to lift up Cassandra Orgeson. This is Sister Barb's... Um, daughter-in-law and they still do not have answers on what it is that she's going through and we're just going to believe that God would give them doctors some answers God would heal her God would just do whatever God wants to do with her amen we're going to lift up uh, Dixie Crutzinger and just believe that God's going to continue to lift her up and that she would continue to be a testimony in her life to other people um, the David Wooden family we're going to lift them up and we're going to pray for um, healing for David Pastor David also, again, not with us tonight. He's not feeling well. And let's just pray that when he wakes up in the morning that he's feeling better yeah. and that um, he experiences God the same way that we experience God tonight. Yeah. We're going to continue to lift up Missy. This is Sister Amber's stepmom's sister and believe that um, God's going to heal Missy. And Eddie Wheeler, <clears throat> he's not doing well is what Sister Barb says. Sherry Wheeler is doing better but still needs a continued healing. She's still in the hospital. So let's continue to lift up Eddie and Sherry Wheeler. Right, and let's just, uh, if you have an unspoken request, lift your hand. There's a lot of people on Facebook, I believe, they are lifting their hands. We know in this church people who aren't here who've got needs. Try and, try and remember, not just now, but try and remember some of these needs. Lift them up this week. Lift them up. I'll go through all these, but lift up a few of these names that we've mentioned. And... If you can't think of anything else to pray about as we're, as we're going to the Lord in prayer, just start 
Just start praising God. Just start saying the name of Jesus. Just speak his name out and praise him for who he is. Each one of us have a testimony. Each one of us can speak of his goodness. Just praise him for what he's done. Amen. Let's go to the Lord. We just come to you this evening. We thank you, Lord, that you are working in this church body. Lord, that every time that we gather together, we see your presence fall, that you begin to speak to us. You begin to address each one of us right where we are, Lord. You know each one of our needs. You know our struggles. You know our weaknesses. And, Lord, we just want to submit ourselves, each one of us, this evening to you and your will and just ask that your power that your presence, that your spirit would fall in this place, Lord, and that you would just have your absolute way in us, Lord. Lord, we lift up Melissa this evening. We lift up the name Al and Vicki and Justin Haas, each dealing with cancer. Lord, Sarah, who's had this report, Lord, that's it's not a good report, Lord. They don't expect much of her, Lord. They don't expect her to last long. But, Lord, we believe that you are bigger than this report. We believe that you're able to turn this situation situation around and we're believing for healing in each one of these people tonight lord we pray that each one of these families would be encouraged this evening lord that tomorrow that they would wake up and there would just be something that would click in them and they would know that they are not walking through this alone but that you they walk with this in this situation with their creator lord and, Lord, we want to lift up John and Susan Gieselman and just ask that you would continue, Lord, your faithfulness in their lives. Lord, that you would continue to walk with them. Lord, that they would continue to be healed and encouraged, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, that you have been doing a good work. I was messaging with Susan today, Lord, and you have been relieving her symptoms. And I thank you for that. But, Lord, we, we're believing for an absolute healing in both of their lives this evening. In Jesus' name. And, Lord, we ask that you would touch Carol Strange tonight, Lord. You know what's going on in his body. You know what he needs. And, Lord, we just want to just ask that this evening that you would touch Carol, that you would encourage Carol. Lord, that the nurses that are dealing with him, the people that are, that are helping him, Lord, that they would be able to speak words to him. Lord, that would just bring him up emotionally so his body could begin to heal. And, Lord, we, we want to pray for Sister Barb this evening, Lord, who hated not to be with us but but she felt terrible we just pray and believe that tomorrow morning when she wakes up that everything that she is dealing with everything that barb is suffering lord that it would just all be gone lord that she would have her energy restored that she wouldn't be coughing and that she would be completely healed in your name lord and we thank you for that lord we thank you for what you're doing in bob rainey's life Lord, I don't know that he's a lot better physically, but it sounds like he's a whole lot better spiritually. And we want to thank you for that. We want to praise you for your response. Lord, you take care of the important things. Lord, you have your hand on, Bob. And we thank you for that. Just pray, Lord, now that he is in the place that he is in, that you would begin to just touch him and heal him physically and show yourself to him, your love to him, and just how precious he is to you, Lord. And we pray for Cassandra this evening. She's discouraged because the doctors don't know what to do. And I just pray that Cassandra would turn her eyes from the doctors tonight and that she would set her eyes upon you. Lord, that she would believe you for answers, that she would believe you for healing. In Jesus' name, we just ask that you would do a great thing in Cassandra. And Lord, we just want to ask right now for Terry Moore. Lord, we know he needs a powerful move. We're believing with Terry. Terry knows your power. Terry, he has experienced your hand, Lord. He knows your goodness. And we're just believing that tonight you're going to fall in the Moore home and that he's going to experience you even greater than Terry has ever, ever experienced you, Jesus. Touch him, Lord. Let him touch your hand, Lord, of your gown and just be completely healed this evening in Jesus' name. And Lord... We thank you for the work that you've already done in Dixie Crutsinger. Lord, we ask that you would just continue to, to move in her. Lord, we ask that she would get a new testimony, that you would just heal her of just another thing, Lord, that she can just share, that she can speak of your goodness to somebody and offer hope, Lord, in her situation in Jesus' name. And Lord, David Wooden and his family, Lord, we just pray for healing in him. We pray for encouragement in that family. 
family, Lord. You know exactly what they need. You know the struggles, maybe the doubts even that they're suffering. And we just pray, Lord, that they would be able to look to you, that they would see the hope that they still have in you, Lord, despite what they're going through. And, Lord, that they would be able in this situation, as dark as it is, as much as they don't want to go through it with everything they've gone through this year, Lord, we just pray that you would be able to use this to draw them even closer to you, Lord. Heal David this evening, Lord. Heal Pastor David this evening. Lord, we just pray that you would touch him in his mind, Lord, in his spirit, in his physical, man, that Pastor David would begin to be healed tonight. Lord, that he would know, Lord, that this situation that's been going on for the past few years is still not bigger than you are, that you are still able to heal him. Him, and we speak life. We speak healing in His body, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we want to pray that you would just use this situation of, that Missy's going through, Lord. We're believing for healing. Lord, we do believe that you're going to heal her. We believe this is going to go different than the doctors have said. But Lord, I believe that you're going to use this as a testimony to Sister Amber's entire family. That they wouldn't, when they see what you do, that they won't be able to explain it. And they will know that it had, there's no way that it could be anything. It had to be you, Almighty God, that moved in Missy's life. And we want to thank you because we are that confident in you and what you are doing in her life already. And Lord, we believe that you're also, that you're not done with Eddie and Sherry Wheeler. We believe that you still have ministry for those people. We believe that you're going to heal them. We believe that as we speak right now that they are beginning to be comforted, to be healed, to be touched, to be lifted up, and that whoever is working on them, Lord, that they have the opportunity to just speak of your goodness tonight, Lord. And Lord, every person who raised their hand, we believe, Lord, that you are already working in those situations. Lord, I raised my hand. Lord, I need answers. I need a move of your spirit in my life. And I pray for every person who lifted their hand in faith. Lord, we believe that you already know, that you know what each one of us need. And we believe that you are able and that you are everything, that you are all in all. And Lord, we believe as we leave this place that each one of us will be touched, that each one of us will be moved, and that each one of us will receive new revelation in you, Jesus. And Lord, we want to thank you. We want to praise you, Lord, for the work that you've been doing in this church body. The way you've been, the way you've been encouraging people in our ministries. You've been changing us. You've been lifting us up from where we were into new places. And we want to pray that each one of these ministries will begin to pour out of this building and out into this community. And that we will begin to see people that we don't even know their faces right now, but that we will be begin to see them saved, that we would see begin to see people filled with the Holy Ghost in this place, Lord. We just pray that you would have your way tonight in this service, Jesus. We praise you for who you are, Lord. We love you. You are good. We see, we see your spirit already moving in this place tonight. I can feel your presence, Lord, and I love it. And I love you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you your hands to the Lord. Could we do that together tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Does anybody have a shout of praise on your lips or you could just shout a praise to the Lord right now? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't you glad to be in church tonight? Amen. So thankful to all of you that have come to be with us on Wednesday night or Wednesday night Bible study, Bible class. I, I, I'm going to try to get used to calling it Bible class as opposed to Bible study. Uh, I do feel like it's more of a class than a, than a Bible study at this point. And uh, I'd sure enjoy what we feel and what we experience on Wednesday nights, don't you? Amen. Praise the Lord. It is my mission to teach tonight and uh, try to maintain a respectable level 
volume as I try to teach tonight. I, I promise I'll do my best. We're going to go to Genesis, the 24th chapter, uh, and read several verses there. And then also we're going to Luke, the 11th chapter. And uh, as you're turning there, just a couple of announcements. One is I want to congratulate our ladies, our landmark ladies, for such an incredible job on uh, the uh, Cards of Hope. I know that we're over a 1,000 now, uh, and they've been working this week to put together uh, port pillows and blankets, and uh, what an incredible ministry this is. Uh, we actually have uh, a, a, a meet with Phil's friends here in the next several days that uh, we're going to hand deliver several, well, all of these items. Uh, we have another work day uh, this Friday from 2 to 6, and uh, would welcome uh, any lady that wants to come and be a part of that. Uh, you don't have to come in, at 2 and stay until 6. Just any time in there that you can come uh, would be fantastic. What was that? Yeah, and, and I know that they got a lot done on uh, Tuesday, so it may not last until 6 p.m., but if you are able to help, come out and be a part of that. I promise you God's going to bless you for it. Uh, we believe that every item that's coming out of this church, before it's ever delivered, I can tell you it's going to be prayed over. Um, and uh, I can tell you that the ladies that have been working on this have been do doing it diligently, and I believe that it's been done with passion, and I believe it's been done for a lot under the unction of the Holy Ghost. And We believe that every card that's opened, every port pillow that's used, every blanket that's used to cover up with, I think everything that we send out, we're believing that God is going to do a miraculous work through what we're giving out in this ministry. And somebody said amen. Uh, for all of our MIT folks and then all of our ministry staff, uh, we have a meeting here at the church May the 1st at 9 a.m. If you're part of MIT Ministers in Training or you've been part of our first two uh, uh, ministry leaders meetings this uh, coming Saturday at 9 a.m., uh, the the goal is to be done by 1. I don't want you to plan that time to be with us, 9 to 1. Uh, mobile Market's coming May 22nd. We're super excited to partner again with United Way and be a, a point of entry into the community where we're able to give boxes away. If you would like to, feel free to go ahead and start advertising that, letting people know. We'll open somewhere between 9 and 10. Not sure exactly when we'll have the key to open the truck, but somewhere between 9 and 10 and begin handing those out. We'll have between three and 400 boxes. Directly after that, that Saturday, May 22nd, is our men's work day. We've got a couple trees we're going to fall and a couple things that we want to do around the church. Uh, very minor things for our men. we got giants in this church. that they don't, they don't just work hard. They work hard, good and fast, and uh, uh, we'll be providing lunch all the men that are, are going to be working with us that day. I also want to reiterate what Pastor Chris said. We are extremely excited about our new venture. He and, and Brother Ted and Sister Amber have done such a fantastic job of figuring out the direction our church needs to go with regard to Celebrate Recovery. I, I know most people know this, but I want to say it tonight. You know, the, these things take hours. Uh, and they have studied this stuff for hours. They've spent hours on phone calls. They've been to meetings. They've visited with other pastors and other churches. There's a number of things that have gone into this. And so we know that when we put this on, it's going to be done right. And I want to publicly thank them. I'll do it again on Sunday for all of their hard work. Thank you all so very much for what you've done with that. And I encourage anybody that's looking for something to be involved in, get involved in this. Get involved in it. Less than 30% of the people that are involved in Celebrate Recovery have anything to do with alcohol or drug abuse. Less than 30%. 70% of the people deal with anxiety. They just need a friend. They need a place of community, a place to help them get through their day. So I encourage you to be a part of that. I think Brother Chris already mentioned the registration uh, sheets on the back this Sunday will be your last opportunity to sign up for that. And in the, the timeline is critical. So we'll remind you again on Sunday. I think they, they could still fill it out on Sunday. Is that correct? Okay, but we need to have it by Sunday. Somebody say praise the Lord. 
Genesis chapter 24, begin reading with verse 34. And I invite you to read it out loud with us. I promise I'll let you be seated soon. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. And he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old. And unto him hath he given all that he has. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Peradventure the woman will not follow me. And he said unto me, The Lord before whom I walk, will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. Then shalt thou be clear from this my oath. When thou comest to my kindred, and if they give not thee one, thou shalt be clear from my oath. And I came this day unto the well and said, O, God, o Lord God of my master Abraham, if now Thou do prosper my way which I go. Behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass, that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink. And she say to me, Both drink thou, and I will also draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down unto the well and drew water, and I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste, somebody say she got in a hurry, and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. Skipping down to verse 58. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. Moving to Luke chapter 11, verse 1, and it reads like this, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to, Lord, teach us to, Lord, teach us to, as John also taught his disciples. I want to talk to you tonight about this thought, beauty in the beast. Beauty in the beast. Lord, we're so thankful for your word and so thankful for your spirit. Thankful for this prayer service tonight. God, I pray that you would help us to receive from you. Open our hearts and our minds. Let me do a good job in a short amount of time. Let us all go home safely and Field on the food of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, and I wonder, would you shout amen? High five somebody and tell them there's beauty in the beast. You may be seated. One day a man became lost in a dense forest. Desperate for a, to find a way out, he plunged deeper into the forest than he had ever been before. When all hope seemed gone of finding a way out, the man happened upon a wondrous castle surrounded by beautiful gardens. He picked a beautiful rose from the hedge. Barely had he done so than a huge hideous beast appeared, demanding to know why he had stolen a rose from the garden. The man was so scared that he could hardly speak, let alone think. Eventually, however, the man, the, the man managed to explain that the rose reminded him so much of his lovely daughter named Beauty. The beast promised to let him go if he would bring Beauty back to the castle to live forever. The man went away from the castle sorrowful, for Beauty was such a lovely girl. Nevertheless, he made a promise, and he returned to the castle with Beauty. The young lady was enchanted with the castle and its fountains, its ex exotic birds and exquisite furnishings, yet the ugly beast marred the appearance of all of it. Some of our, some of our women who are married say, Amen. <laughs> One 
One night at dinner, the beast asked Beauty to marry him, but she refused. But over time, a friendship blossomed. And on a short visit back home, Beauty realized that she had fallen in love with the beast. And the next time the beast asked her to marry him, she accepted, and he was immediately changed into a handsome prince. And they were married and lived happily ever after. Don't you wish it was that easy? <laughs> The moral of this 18th century story by Madame Gabriel de Villanueva whew, is that sometimes, indeed many times, true beauty is often disguised in ugliness. Now, everybody loves a love story. All of our men said amen. Now, if I find out that all my men are at home watching the Hallmark Channel, we're going to have to have another conversation. But the reality is everyone loves a love story. I, I don't care how rough and tough you are. I don't care how dirty your nails are. Everyone loves a love story. And, and I, I know that, that, that in, from my time in, in, in the pulpit and the number of times that I've spent behind a pulpit, that the previous two minutes I, I probably had more of your attention than I will have the rest of my time up here because everybody loves a love story. And the Bible has so many love stories full of, of the right ingredients, tragedy, intrigue, romance. I think of Jacob and Rachel, and I think of, uh, of Esther and, and Xerxes, and I think of Ruth, and I think of Boaz, or the one from which we just read, which is Isaac and Rebecca. And this is one of the most favorite of love stories because it is so much like the greatest love story that has ever been told, and that is the one of Jesus and his bride and the church. Isaac is very much like Jesus. He was born in supernatural circumstances to his aged parents. <laughs> she was almost 100 and he was over 100. Somebody say, oh my, Jesus was born into supernatural circumstances as well. Isaac carried his own wood up to his sacrifice, just like Jesus did his cross up a hill. Rebecca is very much like the bride of Christ, the church. Rebecca went the second mile, as the church is also instructed to do. Rebecca was willing to leave her world behind in pursuit of one she had never seen or known before. The church is also making a similar pilgrimage. We have not seen him, but our hearts tell us that God is waiting for us. But I don't want to focus so much upon Isaac or Rebecca or Christ or the church. I, I, I don't even want to focus so much on Eleazar, Abraham's servant, a, a, a marvelous portrayal of spirit-anointed ministry. Notice this. Isaac is mentioned eight times in this story. Rebecca is mentioned 13 times. And the servant is mentioned 14 times. But the character I want to talk about tonight mentioned more than any other in this story. Some 17 times. Through this character, Rebecca was revealed as the future bride. Upon the shoulders of this character, Rebecca was delivered to Isaac. The character is not human. It is, in fact, a beast. It is often referred to as the ship of the desert and the burden bearer. By this beast, the bride was selected. Upon this beast, the bride is delivered. The character, the beast I want to talk about tonight is a camel. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and tell him we're a camel. I'm just kidding. The beast I want to talk about tonight is a camel. Lord Eliezer prayed, let the young lady who not only offers water to me, but, but, but waters these camels as well, let her be the one. What the servant had asked for was, was no small task. This was a big deal. He had ten camels with him, double parked at the well that day, and, and each camel could drink up to 30 gallons of water. Now, it, it doesn't take a lot of figuring and a lot of equating to understand that that. that 10 camels, 30 gallons of water is equivalent to 300 gallons of water a person had to carry up the steps from the well. That's a lot of agua. 
And along comes Rebecca with a group of girls from her village. And she sees the stranger at the well with his camel caravan and draws water for the stranger. And then in fulfillment of his prayer request, she watered the camels until they stopped drinking. She filled the camels up. That reminds me of another time when the disciples had witnessed our Lord praying. So profound was its impact on them. One of the disciples separated from the pack and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Martin Luther once wrote, as a shoemaker makes a shoe and a tailor makes a coat, so ought a Christian to pray. Prayer is the daily business of a Christian. John Bunyan said to be a Christian means to be one who prays. You see, you can be a Christian and not be able to sing. He said make a noise. He didn't say you had to sing on tune. You can belong to the church without being able to read. I've been in this a long time, and there are a number of people. They, you can tell them to open the Bible, but they can't read the words on the Bible. You can be in God's family and, and not have the ability to stand in front of other people and preach or teach. But you cannot be a Christian without being able to pray. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 says, We are to pray without ceasing. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 says, Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Ephesians chapter 6, 18 says to pray always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit. Philippians 4, 6 tells us to be careful for nothing but in everything let your request be made known unto God. Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, I exhort thee therefore that, that first of all prayers... 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people will pray, there is a way you can tell what child of God will make it to the wedding day. There is a vehicle for delivering God's people. It is the uncomely, awkward, and ungainly beast of prayer. Prayer is the universal approach to God. We offer up our worship and praise through prayer. We receive His Spirit through prayer. We receive direction through prayer. We can pray anywhere because God is everywhere. Doesn't matter if your name is Rebecca, Daniel, or Paul, whether it's Smith, Brown, or McDonald. The names change, but the vehicle remains the same. Things don't change prayer, but prayer certainly does change things. And I, I want to say that, that, that I, I feel like I'm a pretty progressive person. I remember when I was in my late teens and early 20s, and, and I remember that it was common for me to wear a, a pair of pants to, to church that, that, that the, 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 the pants bloomed out about this far. And they were as white as white could be. And I'd have on a royal blue jacket, and I thought I was as cool as cool could be. Now, you would laugh me off of this stage today if I showed up looking like that to preach to you because that was 90s. We're not in the 90s anymore, and I feel like I have progressed. And, 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 and I feel like in a lot of things in my life I've progressed. I feel like I, the, the, with technology, I, now I'm not the most tech savvy, uh, but when you compare me to Pastor David, I mean, I'm Bill Gates, I hope he's watching tonight and I get an amen from him. I feel like that I have progressed and I feel like as church people we have progressed. I feel like we've, we've come further than we've ever been before. I do. I've said this multiple times from this pulpit and it, it begs to be said again tonight and that is we have access to so much stuff today. You can watch preaching and teaching of the Word of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week on your television set. You can go on YouTube. You can go on Facebook. You can find it on Instagram. You can even follow them on Twitter and Snapchat and get snippets of the Word of God. If you go to BibleGateway.com, you can look up any, any interpretation of the Bible. There are hundreds of 
of interpretations of the Bible that make it easier for us to understand some of that old English that comes out of that good old King James Version. We have seminars that are held all across this country, all throughout the world, just talking about God, helping us. We've got more educated preachers today than we have ever had. Preachers who have degrees, preachers who have, have real life experience, who, who have, have, some of them have master's degrees. Some of them are doctor, have a whole doctorates in, in all kinds of fields, including theology. We are better trained than we've ever been. We have more knowledge. We have more points of entry and access to different things than we've ever had before. But as I stand before you today, I am a tad convicted, Pastor Chris. I'm a tad convicted because I think that sometimes we get so caught up in the progressive movement and the idea of how we need to look as we move forward that we forget about the old path. And, and there are a number of things that we can change. We can change the lights and, and we can change the, 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 the pews to chairs and somebody says, thank you, Jesus. I sat on those old pews for a long time and they're not near as comfortable as the chairs today. We can improve our sound system and, and, and we can get neat pulpits and, and we can figure out color schemes that are cool and, and we can give the church a facelift and, and, and we can do all of those kind. We can learn new music and, and have uh, extra instruments that just add all kinds of things that really help propel us forward into the, to the, the, to the new era. But I'm telling you, if we forget some of the things that we need to hold us close to God, progressive movement means nothing. We can have the biggest church. We can have the best looking church. It can be the Taj Mahal of churches. We can have golf carts that bring people in so you don't even have to step but two steps outside of your car to get into the church. But if God is not involved, it is nothing. And I would present to this church that in our progressive movement, in our conversation about being pulled forward and making sure that we're relevant, and let me tell you, I want you to know, undoubtedly, 100%, I believe we need to be relevant. We need to be in touch with society. We need to be in touch with our world. We cannot be on a completely different plane that doesn't make any sense to people outside of here. We have to have something that is compelling people to come and be a part but I'm telling you we can have the best programs we can have all kinds of fancy stuff but if we don't have those old paths that are still clear that show us exactly how we are to get in contact with God then we have missed the point entirely and we run the risk of missing the move of God and we run the risk of missing the will of God in our life prayer is an old path and since we have access to so much today I would dare say it I don't think I'm stepping too far out on a limb by saying that prayer is one of those things just like the Bible that collects a lot of dust on a shelf somewhere it is time to return to an old path of prayer. Prayer is our burden bearer. It is uniquely designed to carry the church from earth to glory. Those who tarry are endued with power from on high. Those who say, I will not let go until you bless me, have, have found the power that is only found in prayer. Now, I recognize that some find prayer to be ugly. Have you ever seen a camel? <laughs> They're not attractive. If, if you're going to have an exotic animal in your front yard to show your neighbors, your first choice isn't going to be a camel. A camel is not a gazelle. It does not have the grace of a lynx or a leopard. It is not particularly beautiful. Some find prayer to be the same. A difficult beast to appreciate. In fact, let's go ahead and say it. Some people just hate to pray. 
One of the devil's wildest, wildest tricks is to destroy the best with the good. It is good to teach a Sunday school class, sing in the choir, testify, and work around God's house, but it is best to pray. You see, in those moments that, that, that when we look away to Jesus, that's when lives are truly changed. Prayer is easy. Prayer is hard. That's the paradox of touching God. It's easy to pray in terms of simplicity. However, it's hard because it's such humbling work. When we really get involved in prayer, it abases our intellect. It, 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 it crucifies our vainglory and witnesses to our spiritual bankruptcy. It testifies to the fact that apart from Christ, and John, in John 15, 5, he, he testifies to this, that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Now, I, I don't know about you, but my flesh has never enjoyed being humbled. I'm 46 years old working on 47. I'm working real hard to get there. And all this gray in my beard showing how hard I'm working. But even today, I'm smarter today, at least I feel like I am, than I was yesterday. And I know that I'm smarter today than I was when I was 16. But, but Brother Denny, today I don't enjoy being humbled any more than I did back then. Yet the downside of avoiding this humbling is that the Lord knows the proud from a distance and that's exactly where he keeps them. You can read about that in Psalms 138 verse 6. Prayer is a daily reminder that when we get too big for God to use us, that we can get too big for God to use us, but we can never be too small. We need bread daily. We need God daily. Though we hear the applause of thousands, if we fail to hear the soft clapping of two nail-scarred hands, what are we? I would submit to you that we are nothing. Lord, teach us to pray. More than this, God, teach us to find beauty in this beast called prayer. I believe prayer has a threefold beauty. Can I share them with you tonight? There is no extrinsic beauty to prayer. Prayer is, is brutal business. But if we look beyond the cursory glance with its inconveniences, its tears and travail, we could find the beauty only found in prayer. Rebecca, on that pivotal day, when your life has changed, what beauty did you see in those beasts? Why were you willing to go the second mile to water these camels? Rebecca, could you tell, tell us why we should pay attention to the beast? After all, prayer was fine for the brush harbors and the storefronts. But surely we've progressed beyond that. Rebecca, do we still need this beast? And that's what I'm talking about. We're more intelligent, we're fancier, we're more comfortable than we've ever been. But those old folks that just had a couple of people they were stringing something together that was moving and shaking the foundations of the earth in those old brush harbors, and I would submit to you it was prayer. Azusa Street started with a prayer meeting, not with a song service. If Rebecca could speak, I wonder what she would say. Perhaps she would speak of the first and most obvious beauty of this beast. Number one is it comes highly recommended. You see, Re Rebecca wasn't given a choice the vehicle sent from the father's house was the camel. Jesus rode this beast extensively. He put prayer through the paces in the wilderness, on the mountaintop, in the garden, and in the cemetery. Throughout his earthly ministry, we find Jesus meeting with this beast of prayer all the time. Before Calvary could be reached, the beast had to be ridden in Gethsemane. Can I share... Can I share one of my, my grandmother Williams' favorite verses? It's found in James chapter 5, verse 16, and it proclaims, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Grandma, why in the world were you praying this morning at 4 o'clock when I was trying to sleep? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. 
Grandma, I don't understand why I hear you wailing and moaning and groaning in the middle of the night calling out my name and calling out my uncle's name and calling out these people's name. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If she told me that once, she's told it to me a thousand times. She lived it. She saw miracles happen. She found the availing power of fervent prayer. And as Lois and Enos of old, Timothy's grandmother and mother, she passes this down to her family. The second thing she would say about it is, about its beauty is that it has stamina and it has strength. Did you know that camels can survive Arctic cold or Sahara heat? Did you know that? Did did you know that they can carry up to a 1,000 pounds of cargo even in the desert? Did you know that they can travel for days without food or water and they have tremendous reserves of strength? Why is prayer beautiful? Because it has stamina and it has strength. Rebecca, if, if, if Isaac truly loved you, he would have sent you a chariot pulled by an Ara- by Arabian stallions. I, I can imagine her smile and say, you don't know much about the desert then, do you? These camels may not be much to look at, but I'm in this for the long haul. I don't care about winning a race. I want to make sure that I, I complete the trip. I'm 400 miles from Isaac. When I'm through watering and feeding these camels, these camels can go over 1,000 miles without refueling. These beasts have the power to see me through. You see, prayer has more than enough power to get you home. And according to Luke chapter 18, verse 1, Jesus gives you a divine multiple choice. He says you can either pray or you can faint. The third beauty I believe should share is it has an inner guidance system. You may not know this about a camel, but a camel is much like a pigeon. It has an inner guidance system. If, if a camel has made the trip once, it can make the trip twice with very little guidance from the driver. Prayer may seem slow, but every step made in prayer is one in the right direction. What a friend, the song says, we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to the Lord in prayer. You see, prayer will see you through. Pastor, I still don't see the beauty. Here it is. They that wait upon the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40, 31 says, where is beauty in that? Hang on. Shall renew their strength. That's the beauty in the beast. Psalms 30, verse 5, weeping may endure for a night. Pastor, where's the beauty in solitary weeping? Here it comes. But joy comes in the morning. Come unto me all who are weary and are heavy laden, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, and I will give you rest. There's beauty in the beast of prayer. So Laban looked at Rachel and said, Wilt thou go with this man? The question is whether we have uh, persevering faith. Do we have what it takes to go all the way with God? Rebecca had already shown she had the ability to go above and beyond the call of duty. Now she had to answer if she was willing. And not only did she have to make that decision once, but each day. During the journey, she had to make a decision to water the beast and to ride it. Are you willing to hold on to the shaggy mane of the burden bearer and say, I will not let go. I'm going to make it to the other side. It was evening, the Bible said, when Isaac walked from his tent and looked to the horizon and he saw Eleazar's camel caravan coming toward him. The Bible shows us and paints a a picture of him racing across the fields to meet his bride. And on that momentous day, maybe Rachel noticed that they kept riding when they should have stopped. It was too it was too too late to stop and make camp. The sunlight was fading fast. Perhaps she noticed Eleazar peering into the distance as if he was wishing to see a familiar sight. Maybe she noticed the camel's pace had begun to quicken, knowing they were almost home, and she hears a shout. 
Then she sees Eleazar pointing to a figure who is racing toward them. Abraham's servant turns to Rebekah and says, this is it. This is the day that we've been preparing for. This is the day we've been longing for. Rebekah, this is why we watered the beast daily. This is why we rode through the desert. That's him and this is your wedding day. And the camels came to a stop. And the Bible says that Rebecca crawled off her camel. And I can't help but imagine before she raced into the arms of Isaac that she turned and looked back at that ugly kneeling beast and said, thank you for carrying me home. What are you talking about, pastor? I'm talking about in a world of chaos. And we are in a world of chaos. Our world is troubled. The waters are troubled on every front. In a world of chaos and uncontrollable controllable busyness, if there has ever been a need and a time to pray, it is today. As we look across the landscape of our present and our future, I want to say it again, the old paths are beginning to disappear. And I believe that if we are going to remain relevant, yes, we have to be progressive. Yes, we have to be forward thinking. Yes, we have to try and do new things. Absolutely, we do. But we better keep the old paths clear because the way we get to God has never changed. The world has changed and the church has to change how we reach them. We have to change. I remember when I was a kid knocking on doors and handing out tracts and people saying, oh, yeah, I'm glad to read that. I dare you to go grab a handful of tracts and knock on somebody's door and try to give them away today. It doesn't work today. It's a different world. Things have changed. we got to connect with people differently. But the way we connect with God does not change because of the way we have to connect with people today. And we cannot allow that old path of prayer to become so convoluted and heavy weighted down with garbage and trash and rubble. We cannot allow that to happen. And I'm saying to this church, we could praise all day long. We could dance and we could shout and we could holler and we could hoop and we can turn the music up and we can scream until our face turns red and our tongue falls out. But if we do not have communication with God through prayer, there is no power. We will be, as the Bible says, of having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And I'm saying to Landmark Church, I was going to apologize for getting excited but you're just going to have to excuse me for a moment. If we truly want to be the church that God has called us to be, we are going to have to be a praying church, a church that is full of prayer. I testified a a week ago or so on a Sunday while I was preaching that I've had people say, I'll tell you what, I can't tell you. We watch your service and there's one thing for sure I don't miss and that is your prayer service. That man can pray. And Brother Chris will tell you, hey, he'll tell you that I'm all behind that. I'm I'm right there with him. I'll support him all day long. You pray and you pray and you pray. I I don't want one of these nickel nickel and dime prayer services. I'm not here just to tickle everybody's ear and for somebody to hear their name come across the pulpit. We're here to pray and and we're, we're counting on and expecting the power of God to do a work. And let me tell you something. You you can be able to praise God and dance and shout and run and not be able to pray your way, way out of a wet paper bag. And I'm here to tell you the only way that you're ever gonna really get God to do what you need him to do is to be involved in prayer, is for it to become part of your life. You wanna see your situation change? Turn off the TV, put Facebook down, and start to pray. If my people will humble themselves and pray, 
Then will I heal their land. Prayer is the key. There's beauty in the beast. It's not pretty. It's not our favorite thing. As a matter of fact, it, it's, it's not what gets the most lights. If you want to be in the spotlight, you can't be a prayer warrior. Prayer warriors, they live their life in darkened corners. <laughs> they, they, they spend their nights on their knees and on their face praying. Their knees are worn out. Their shoes are buckled. Their pants are starting to wear through. Because they're praying. It's not popular. It doesn't draw a crowd. Singing to draw a crowd. Preaching to draw a crowd. But not prayer. Prayer will change your world. And it will change the world of people around you. Can I get a witness? If technology or a drive through can't give it to us in the next 30 seconds, we don't want any of it. We chase fads and half-truths and paste them over ourselves like bumper stickers. But there are some things that only come but by prayer and fasting. My plea to this church, we're going to work on prayer some more. We're going to get down in some nitty-gritty things about prayer because I know there are some people saying, Pastor, I want to pray. I just don't know how. Pastor, I, I want to do better at that, but I don't even know where to begin. And we're going to work on some of those things because you have to know and understand. If you understand nothing else about the Bible, you have to understand, first of all, that God loves you and that he's created a way for you to reconnect with him. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is done through prayer. You have to be able to pray. Would you stand with us tonight? <coughs> There's beauty in this beast. <coughs> when other people look at it and it's it, it, it's not popular, other people look at it and say, I don't see any benefit to that. This church ought to stand up and say it's the key to everything. There's a pastor that I know. <clears throat> He's the son of the man who started this church. And I won't mention where it is. But this church was started in a very small town in a rural area. <clears throat> they don't have a big city to feed from. A bunch of small towns. They started with just their family and a few other people. <coughs> they decided that they were going to change. They decided they were going to change their city. They were going to change the atmosphere. They had a vision and they had a dream. God spoke to this elder pastor and he said, if you want to change... I want a 24-hour prayer chain in your little building. Those 10, 15, 20 people started a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week prayer chain 30-plus years ago, and it's still going today. That church runs over 3,000 people in a town of about 400. Prayer will change your world. Prayer will change the atmosphere in your home. It will change the atmosphere in your heart. Anybody ever struggle with anything that you just don't feel like you can get past? Prayer is the answer. See, you'll run out of goosebumps. There'll be moments where tongues in your life cease. Where you're not excited. You're going through some stuff. The one constant and thing that you're always going to be able to count on is your ability to get an audience with the King of Kings in prayer. Sister Anita, it's not pretty. 
give you red eyes, snotty nose. Sweat through your clothes sometimes. Kneeling on the floor is not comfortable. But there's beauty in the beast. I would like for us tonight just to take just a few moments and ask God to help us become the prayer the prayer team, the prayer warrior, the prayer, the intercessor that he wants us to be or that we need to be to see the revival that God wants to have not around us, not in our church, but in us. Would you just, just for a moment, you don't have to go crazy, <clears throat> but would you begin to pray and ask the Lord, God, would you make me a prayer? Would you ask him, Lord, I pray in your name that you would help me tonight. God, as, as we move forward, as we progress, as, as we evolve and go through a number of different changes following after your work and trying our best to reach out to the harvest that we know is there, God, I'm asking you tonight as the pastor of this assembly, God, please never let us lose sight of the old paths. The way we reach people, the way we do service, the way we play music, the way we jump up and down and dance and shout and worship and all of those things, some of those things evolve and they change. But you're still the same, this beast. To embrace it with everything that is within us, for it to become something that, that we desire, not, not, not that we have to do, not that we're labored in, but something, Lord, that we desire, that we appreciate. We take advantage of every single time we have an opportunity. Lord, that we make opportunity, that we put some things down or move some things out of the way to ensure that we have the time to move forward in prayer and developing that relationship with you. Help us, God, I pray. Help me, Lord, I pray, as the pastor of this church. Oh, God, I pray in your name, help me. God, help me to lead in prayer. Help me, Lord, to be an example of prayer. I pray in Jesus' name, not just for my church, but for my family, I pray, God. In your name, Jesus, lead me down the path that I need to go down. Realize the power of the revival that you have for me. Because, God, I believe that if revival is in me, if I'm, if I'm where I need to be or at least trying really hard to get there, uh, that it opens all kinds of doors for you to use me in ways that I never thought possible. I want to be in tune with your spirit. I want to be ready to go, and I want to make it. And I understand with all of my heart tonight, Lord, that the only way that I can get from here to there is by recognizing the beauty and the beast and having a heart, a mind, a soul, a spirit of prayer living and exercising in me every day. Use us, Lord. Use this church. Use this church to be intercessors, to be earth shakers, to be demon chasers. Jesus, in your name, use us, I pray, through the power of prayer. In the name of of Jesus, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Lord, we want our prayers to not only be heard, but for you to do a great work through them. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Would you just lift your hands and praise the Lord for the opportunity to know him one-on-one. -on -one. God, I thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence to feel the strength and the power and the security of your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to know you personally, to pray to you, to cast my care upon you, to communicate with you. I thank you, God, for the opportunity. I don't deserve it, but I'm so thankful that by your blood and according to your grace, you created a path for me to exercise communication with you through prayer. You are a great, mighty, and wonderful Savior. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for every opportunity that you've given us.
praise the name of the Lord. Would you clap your hands? To the Lord. Would you turn to your neighbor and tell him there's beauty in the beast? Turn to somebody else and high five them and tell them there's beauty in the beast. Praise the name of the Lord. One more time, I'd mention that Friday from 2 to 6, Landmark Ladies will be here. Well, as long as they need to, they'll be here at 2 p.m. working on port pillows and blankets. Is, is that right? Port pillows and blankets? Are we still, we're not doing any more cards on Friday? Or people can do cards if they come? Okay, no cards, just port pillows and blankets. Uh, from 2 to 6. If you're wondering through the day if they're finished, just reach out to Sister Jonna, Sister Nita, and they can answer that for you. They'll let you know if they're still here working or uh, if you've got time to get up here and help. But we would appreciate any that could. All of our MIT folks and our ministry leaders, uh, please be here. Uh, we're going to start sharply at 9 a.m. I'm asking you to be here between 8.45 and 8.50 uh, please be here on time. We will start at 9 a.m. whether you're here or not. Uh, but I'd love for you to be here when we start. So everybody said amen. We may be done before 1, uh, but uh, I want you to be prepared to have that amount of time as we go through this with uh, with Dr. Larry Cole. I'm so thankful that, that he's going to be with us and appreciate his time and consideration and uh, are very, very excited about how he's going to help us um, move forward. Somebody say amen. And then Sunday service, you will not want to miss Sunday service. Oh, before, let, let me make this the, the first announcement. Mother's Day is just a week from this Sunday. Is that not exciting? Amen. So I, I want to announce tonight, number one is uh, that uh, we do have gifts for all the mothers, but we are going to have three additional categories, okay? One of those categories is the mother who has the most guests with them. So it doesn't have to be kids, but any of your family, grandkids, kids, aunts, uncles, friends, whoever, the mother who has the most guests with them, they're going to get a special award. And then the oldest mother is going to get a special award. And then we've got our third one that's a surprise that we're not going to tell you what it is. But all of our moms are going to love these gifts. We've got some really great gifts for these three special these three special people, and God's going to do a great work. That is May the 9th. I think it's 8th, maybe. No, it's the 9th. May the 9th. Somebody say praise the Lord. This Sunday, bring somebody with you. Invite somebody with you. If they can't be here in person, you tell them, boy, you better be on Facebook because God's moving across Facebook, isn't he? He's moving across Facebook. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you so much for all of you that continue to share the services. We appreciate that so very much. What's that? It is the ninth. She's confirming for me, and I'm deaf. So praise the Lord. Mother's Day is the ninth. Be here, be square. Uh, Sunday morning, uh, uh, this May the 1st is, <laughs> or May the 2nd. Boy, my dates are terrible. This coming Sunday, I'm going to stop doing dates. This coming Sunday, be with us in service. I think we still have some stuff in the back from Brother Denny. I think there's some things there. Uh, please pick some of that stuff up on your way out tonight. We love you all, Facebook. We love you. We'll see you on Sunday. Everybody else, God bless you all. Be safe.